Thank you so much, uh, Mark. Really appreciate it. And Tess as well. Uh, Brian, it's a, it's a wonderful pleasure to be in conversation with you after all these years. Uh, and thanks so much to Chicago Studies at UChicago and Seminary Co-op for um, having this conversation. Uh, go get the book. Go get many books. <laughs> go get the variance book. Yeah, thank you. And it's a place that I always, been, whenever I'm in town, I'm, I'm currently in, in Massachusetts, but whenever I'm in town, I'm always, I always make time to uh, sit with many books um, at the seminary. So um, it's wonderful to be in this conversation with this sponsorship. So uh, Brian, you know, as you know, I'm a scholar of the African-American experience and particularly the urban life worlds of black Chicago. And, and I can honestly say that I learned something new or saw something differently on at least every other page of this amazing book, Landscapes of Hope. Uh, one could legitimately argue that black Chicago is the most <laughs> studied, some say overstudied African-American community in the U.S., largely because of the Chicago School of Sociology and other related fields. Um, and yet your book, uh, it's, it's fascinating uh, weaving together of environmental and cultural historical methods. It, it shine new and exciting light on the so-called Black Belt, what um, the folks called, called Bronzeville. Uh, and it forced us to look again at things we thought we knew so well. So I, I just want to, first of all, just put a pin in that and say thank you for what you did with this work. Um, Landscapes of Hope, um, even in a title, suggests a playful conversation with Jim Grossman's Land of Hope, which provides, which provokes an important interplay in your work between African-American history and environmental studies. Could you say more about that interplay and how you came to this convergence point, kind of an origin story, if you will? Um, you know, and finally, and after that, you know, what do we see differently about the Great Migration and Chicago's rich Black history through the lens, landscape, through the lens of landscape and environments? Well, thanks so much for that introduction, Mark and, and Deverian. Um, yeah, it's, it's a real, pleasure to, to have this conversation with you because you were there at the origin of, of this project. I mean, uh, I, I haven't had the pleasure of having this kind of conversation with you probably since my dissertation defense, which was like a decade ago now. Um, Ooh, Asian us. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I mean, the, the, the project itself, I mean, if I could jump off from your earlier point about the Chicago School of Sociology, right? Mm -hmm. Taking uh, a book like Drake and Caton's Black Metropolis, published in the 40s, sort of the seminal study of the Black metropolis, uh, taking its data from the 30s, a, a passage in there, a moment in there where Drake and Caton say that some someplace like Washington Park is a community institution on the South Side, they sort of drop that there and then move on and talk about the politics, the education world, the, the, the world of uh, you know, the stockyards and the steel mills, the, the world of domestic laborers that we all know from the scholarship that you and, and other scholars of Black Chicago have produced. And I thought, we've got this moment where it's dropping Washington Park is this 371 acre park on the South Side that is a community institution. I wanna know more about that. Mm -hmm. And you know, there was already scholarship out there. Colin Fisher had an article in a, a book about African-American environmental culture uh, called To Love the Wind and Rain, which is about Black Chicago and, and the environmental uh, landscapes uh, of the South Side. Um, and that turned into a book that he published uh, just a, a year or two before mine called Urban Green, which a chapter of that is on Black Chicago. But I, I read that passage in Black Metropolis. I read Colin Fisher's uh, chapter length work on it. I read a book called Andrew Weiss's uh, Places of Their Own, which talked about African-American suburbanization and the ways in which Southern folkways, Southern culture was translated to uh, an urban or suburban environment. And I thought there's gotta be more of a story here. Um, now, you know, I mean, it started as a dissertation uh, in grad school and it was way more ambitious um, as all dissertations are. Than as they the, should be. Yeah, the, then the book that ended up being published in 2017 and is now on paperback, way more ambitious. And the, the nut of the argument was like, I am going to write an environmental history of the Great Migration mm -hmm. uh, through Chicago, right? Because Chicago is the most studied 
arguably the most studied great migration destination, maybe the most important, at least next to New York, if not number one, then number two. And, um, you know, at, at that point, I, I thought that I could write an environmental history that encapsulated urban gardening, that, encapsul that, that also included uh, the environmental resonances of the steel mills and the stockyards, right? What did it mean for African-American laborers to work in those environments, processing natural raw materials into goods that sort of created, uh, you know, the urban modern environment? And some of that made it into the dissertation, but by the time it made it to the book stage, it just didn't seem like that other stuff fit. So Landscapes of Hope, to get back to your original question, sort of playing on Jim Grossman's Land of Hope, that seminal study of the Great Migration in Chicago. Um, I, I arrived at that conceptual idea very late in the game. Um, when I realized that the archival resources that the vast majority of what I had written and the arguments that I was producing really concerned green space, not just in Chicago proper, Washington Park, other park spaces in Chicago, but the forest preserves, but places like Idlewild in rural Michigan, more exurban spaces, uh, the Skokie Lagoons on the North Shore, right, which African American labor uh, in large part helps dig out of, of the swamps. And I thought, landscapes of hope that sort of encapsulated what so many African-American migrants hope to be able to find in some place like Chicago, mm -hmm. right? To be free of the threat of racial violence, to be free of uh, Jim Crow and disfranchisement in the South uh, and come to Chicago and find places where you can forge productive relationships with natural environments. Now, so much of the book is about how that was stymied, about how white supremacy and racial violence precluded African Americans from understanding, uh, from fully realizing those landscapes of hope. But that was the premise of, of the project and, and sort of narrowing it down to, to green space and leisure space most prominently um, that, that ended up sort of the, the conceptual coherence of the project around that idea. Well, real quickly, you know, um, and I think this is right. I think Jim makes this point, others make this point as well, is that we think about African-American access to democratic citizenship at this critical period of uh, before and after the Great Migration. Um, we talk about, you know, leaving Jim Crow and therefore the democratic citizenship vision shifts from anchoring it in the South to land and moves to the North to labor. But it seems like your work offers a complication of that. That on one sense, we could argue that the landscaping analysis, the environmental approach you offer says that Black people didn't never fully abandon a land-based approach to citizenship. But at the same time, at least what I see with your book, and if, just to be clear, everybody, go get the book. It's Here it is right here. Oh, I got my it. copy, go get Thanks, yours, <laughs> right? Um, that in the North, but at the same time, so there's, just, there's never a full abandonment of land as a, as a route to belonging to citizenship. But at the same time, there's a way in which, and I think it's really interesting with your work, is that there's a way in which work like mine that focuses on kind of urban modernity in the cultural realm, you say, well, no, actually, natural landscapes also become a way for Black folk to make themselves over as modern as well. And so could you speak in that gap a little bit about how you work through that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there, there is a, a transition for the vast majority of migrants uh, in that value of, of land ownership and, and sort of that as a pathway to citizenship and realizing the, the full benefits of American citizenship. When you come to the urban north for the vast majority of migrants, that importance of land transitions from the private, right, land ownership to the public space, which is why spaces like Washington Park become so important. The lakefront in Chicago becomes so important and become points of racial conflict, right? Because African-Americans are asserting those rights to enjoy leisure in those spaces. Rather, and then the other slippage, is the, not, not slippage, but transition is not from, just from private to public, but also from labor to leisure, right? That, that realizing the full benefits of modern life is practicing leisure in those green spaces rather than laboring in them. Now, mm -hmm. the last chapter of Landscapes of Hope sort of complicates that, thinking about the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 30s with African-American labor working in the Skokie Lagoons on the North Shore, downstate Illinois, in the forests of Michigan. Mm 
But I think those are the two primary ways uh, in which the land continues to factor very prominently in ideas of African-American citizenship. And, and one of the ways, honestly, that I wish I had elaborated upon uh, in the book, if I had it to do over again, uh, you know, was, was thinking through the way someone like Ida B. Wells, right, mm. was who is such a rightly lionized figure in, in that narrative of African-American citizenship and her anti-lynching crusade in the South. After she comes to Chicago, right, she is integral to fighting for the formation of what becomes Madden Park in the Bronzeville neighborhood on the South side. Right. To her at that late stage in her career, right, that was just as integral and just as much a part of becoming fully a part of the, the modern city as the earlier struggles, uh, civil rights struggles that are, are much more well known. Right. No, it's a great point. I think also it's just an amazing point. I mean, you know, there's in one way, the landscape that the environmental analysis is, is, is shot through so many aspects of iconic elements of Chicago history, black Chicago history. I mean, as we all know, people that are here, the, 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 the horrific race riots in 1919 begin at a beach. You know, and so I guess the reason I'm, I'm, I'm putting this out, this obvious point out is that, why do you think other scholars didn't take an environmental approach? What is it about an environmental approach or what is it about the historiography, the way scholars have written about the history of Black Chicago for so long um, has forced us or encouraged us to, to allow environmental frameworks to hide in plain sight? Um two things come to mind. One, one is the way that the arc Uh-oh. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello. Can anyone hear me? Yeah, Deverian, I can hear you. I think Brian might just need a minute. He froze. Okay, I just want to make sure it wasn't me. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you, everybody in the chat. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Texas. Uh, really enjoying these questions about land. And I just want to, as we um, wait for Brian to get back on, I want to encourage people as you're listening to please put questions in the chat as they come about. Uh, don't wait till the very end. Please ask the question. You know, as, as something comes to your mind, please just throw it in the chat and we'll we'll, we'll get to it um you know as soon as, as during the q a or even possibly probably during the conversation so thank you for your patience hopefully brian can get back on we can keep it going um and and thank you for being here just hold on hold tight please here he comes i think right now hey brian i'm so sorry i'm back it's all good Connectivity issues. Yeah, we all have been there. All have been. Oh, now oh, yeah. I'm going to stay on data. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> just my Wi-Fi just came back. Um, ah, okay. So, so to answer your your question about you know how and why I think the the environment does not um, factor prominently into the African American historiography about uh, Chicago. One is the archives. The archives are just not set up uh, with the environment in mind, right? They are set up with politics, with education, with leisure in mind, and, and they're cataloged that way, right? The finding aids are set up. I think it's, it's just harder for historians uh, from the get-go to, uh, to, to to think about how to tackle an archive and, and create new arguments with, with primary sources. The other bit of this, I think, has to do with environmental history as a discipline, 
um, mm. you know, which didn't emerge really until the 1970s following the environmental movement. And environmental history as a discipline is still struggling, and that's probably putting it kindly, struggling mightily with diversity, um, mm. not just in terms of the people who uh, write and study environmental history, but the people who read environmental history. I mean, and that inevitably, I think, inflects the kinds of questions that environmental historians even think to ask. Um, uh, so it's, it's only now, like in the past, you know, five, 10 years that I think we've seen a proliferation of, uh, environmental histories that center race, right? I mean, my book is one of them. Uh, Connie Chang has a great book, Nature Behind Barbed Wire, about the environmental historical resonance of, uh, Japanese American internment during World War II. Mm. But, but these are projects that just, you know, like in, in 2021 makes sense. And it, it sort of blows my mind that, that, you know, 20 years ago, they didn't occur to anyone. Yeah. Um, no, keep going, keep going. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I just, I, you know, from a, from a, a scholarly perspective, and you, you made a great point that's intriguing to me in terms of environmental historians in the traditional asking a certain set of questions. But if you turn your attention to the African-American archive, there are a different set of questions. Mm -hmm. So if, I was wondering if you could take us through kind of just like sketching out the book and talk to us about how maybe an environmental historian might have, might have asked questions of this material and how the data, the, the, the archive you used, you know, as you go through the chapters, you know, offer maybe they, they would, how they would have missed these, these sources or how you've asked, you had to ask different questions of these materials than a traditional environmental historiographical uh, frame. Mm -hmm. Is that too much? No, no, it's great. Um, so, you know, I mean, some of the, the initial archival resources that I use that, that are really well used by other historians of Black Chicago are like the YMCA and YWCA archives. Um, the archives that are, um, you know, from, from Richard Wright and the WPA, those kinds of archives down at the Vivian Harsh uh, collection. Um, those are archives that I think historically in the historiography have been used to make arguments about class politics within Black Chicago, about, you know, middle-class reformers, um, you know, arguably paternal. Realistically, am I frozen again? Okay. Yeah, I was, it was for a minute, you're good, second. I'm you're back. Okay, um, but have, have historically made that argument about um, class politics in, in yeah. Chicago. And uh, I think probably saw the portion of the archive about the YMCA camp, uh, Camp Wabash in Southwestern Michigan, that was the first, you know, de facto segregated African-American YMCA camp that was owned by the African-American YMCA in Chicago. Saw that as peripheral to the larger story about mm. uh, class politics. But I see that and I see, you know, you have urban African-American middle-class reformers taking yeah. working class African-American children out of the city to the country for a week or two at a time. You've got them working in a truck garden, producing food to bring back to the city. You've got them uh, taking swimming lessons. You've got them on nature hikes. Uh, to me as an environmental historian and an African-American historian, I see that as an environmental story. And, I, mm -hmm. and I'm just not sure that, that people who are in the arc historians who are in the archives before me saw that as an environmental story. There's a comment in the chat that says that, you know, maybe, maybe you speak to this. There's also a context of the urban is not, na is not nature. Um, did, did you find that you think as well? That the understanding the urban is not nature as being anti kind of anti-nature or the opposite of nature? Yeah. For sure. And I, I think that was that was one of the key assumptions of the historiography that the, the book wanted to that I wanted the book to push back against. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there seems to be an assumption, you know, from Jim Grossman's Land of Hope before that, even the, the Black Chicago historiography, you know, Alan Spear and yeah. all, all of those folks yeah. um, that that I think are are influenced by honestly the, the post-World War II reality of what Black Chicago became and struggling with the urban crisis, mm -hmm. seeing, seeing that environment as 
wholly urban and separate from the yeah. natural world. Um, and my project was to, to, to contest that, not only with landscapes like Washington Park on the south side and thinking about how urban environments could actually offer, uh, you know, sort of a, a transitional simulation of mm -hmm. environments that black migrants from the south were familiar with mm -hmm. from the south, whether it's the Washington Park Lagoon or the lakefront, right, going fishing, uh, going swimming, that sort of thing. Um, but also those exurban environments that were actually more accessible to African Americans in Chicago than I think the historiography lets on, right? Yeah, I think yeah. I think mo mobility in the city, um, not just although probably predominantly for the middle to upper classes, um, but mobility was a lot more did a lot more to connect African Americans to exurban spaces than the historiography allowed for. I was going to say from a vernac, I mean, being a, a, a grandchild of the great migration myself, um, I think there's a vernacular component to it as well. The idea of when you've made it in the city, you are the opposite of, you're not country, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want that red dirt on your shoes. Like there's a whole narrative around not being, about being as modern, as urban, as anti-country, anti-nature as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just from a vernacular perspective, but anyway, um, just for those but who are if uninitiated, I could, if I could respond to that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, go ahead, of, go ahead, go you ahead. You know, one of, one of the things when I started this project that I didn't really think that I would have the opportunity to do or the uh, the ability to do was to interview migrants themselves. Because mm -hmm. when I started this project, I thought, you know, I'm cutting this thing off in 1929, 1930, and people aren't just going to just aren't going to be around uh, to talk to right when I started this project in the 20 teens. Um, but but the great thing was, is that I, I took the timeline up to the 30s and, you know, Timmy Old Black, who just recently passed away, I mean, uh, was kind enough to talk to me for hours, like multiple times. And one of the stories that he told me was, you know, him and his brother, and this makes it into the book, but him and his brother, Walter, both were sent by their parents to camp. Timuel hated it, right? I mean, exactly what you're saying, DeBerry. Like, I don't, I don't want any of that rural stuff. Like, I'm a city right. kid. Right. Uh, we, I thought we left this stuff behind. But his brother Walter really got into it and really loved fishing. Really loved being outdoors. Um, and, and so I used that as a way of, of sort of exploring these divergent perspectives of the African American experience, which is exactly like the divergent perspectives of the human experience, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, some people are city people, some people are, are not, uh, right. and some people love getting outdoors. Um, so that was, that was one of the interventions that I wanted to make with Landscapes of Hope too, was to tell an African-American story situated within that broader American story that, that really shows that African-Americans were on the same page in many cases despite all of the racial discrimination, all of the racial violence encountered in rural spaces mm -hmm. in wanting to connect with nature, right? There's well, let's, let's, let's get into it. Let's get into the text. For those who are uninitiated, walk us through, I mean, you, you, you start, it's, it's a wonderfully kind of concentric narrative, I mean, uh, mapping of landscaped, you know, blackness, if you will, in Chicago. And you take us to some places we, we know very well with a different lens. And you take this place that we don't normally associate with Black Chicago. So could you just tell the people that are that are on the call on the Zoom, like where are where do you go? Where do you take us? And 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 what do you find in these various you know spaces? Yeah. So uh, the first couple chapters of the book are really focused on the the first decade and a half or so of migration when you have uh, a, you know a rapid uh, market influx into Chicago of African Americans really adjusting to the urban environment. Um, but the first chapter is focused on Chicago proper. Uh, so how African Americans engaged with spaces like Washington Park, but also- or What they call Booker T. Washington Park, right? Right, right. Well, not, well, what, what racist white uh, Hyde Parkers actually right, call right, it Booker right. T. Washington Park. Right. Um, uh, as a way of signifying that oh, this is now black space, gotcha. right? The, right. The, that we are now putting the racial boundary line, not at what is now MLK Drive or South Parkway on the westbound of Washington Park, 
but we're putting it at Cottage Grove on the eastern bound of Washington Park. So there, there are a whole host of issues with the University of Chicago that I'm sure you would love to get into, and we, and we could get deeper into. Uh, now, take, keep taking us through. We, I want everybody um, to hear this great, the great expanse of, of about sites on this book. So please go ahead. So, so I mean, it, it, that that first chapter also takes um, those those seminal, very well known events in Black Chicago's history, like the 1919 riots, starting at 29th Street Beach and unpacking the full significance of that and taking it through the end of the 20s to understand how and why 29th Street Beach becomes de facto exclusively African-American by the end of that decade, when a decade earlier, it was a, the hotbed of racial contention and, and, and racial violence, right, that led to the riot uh, yeah. in those, that, that week in the summer of 1919. Um, and then the second chapter looks at uh, the, the nearly contemporaneous founding of uh, the, probably the uh, African-American resort like Idlewild uh, in, in rural Michigan at that time, thinking through the class politics uh, of that, um, not just middle to upper class African-Americans wanting to get away from white supremacist, white Chicagoans and connect with nature in a way that's completely separate from the white gaze, but also thinking about the class politics within the African-American community, tensions uh, between working class and middle to upper class reformers. Um, so that, that first section of the book is really focused on the teens to the twenties. And then the second section of the book takes that story into the 1930s when you have the tumult of the depression uh, causing a lot uh, of, um, uh, you know, a lot of strife, certainly not just within the African American community, Chicago as a whole, but thinking about what, what is the importance of connections to nature when you have half of African Americans, employable African Americans unemployed in Chicago in the depths of the depression in 32, 33. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what, how, how do those spaces become not just places where a community can come together and try to bond amidst all of that strife uh, with something like the Bud Billiken Day Parade, right? Which is hatched by the, the Chicago Defender uh, in the late 20s, early 30s, and is still a venerable tradition that's going on today. Um, but also how something like the Bud Billiken Day Parade is kind of a middle to upper class reformers response to the ways in which a place like Washington Park was a conduit for much more radical political thought, for communist organizing, uh, for, for working class, pushing back against those middle to upper class reformers that, that had a hold on the black metropolis in the teens and 20s and are worried about losing that hold on, on the black metropolis in the 30s. Yeah. And, then, and then the very last chapter, which is sort of an outlier because the rest of the book focuses almost exclusively on leisure space, the last chapter is focused on African-American labor uh, in uh, la natural and landscaped environments in the 1930s through the Civilian Conservation Corps. Mm. Um, so I've already mentioned this a little bit, but African-Americans, a, a surprisingly significant contingent of you know, 18 to 24 year olds and, and later 18 to like early 30s, uh, African-American men coming largely from Chicago because that was where the bulk of, of African-American population was in the state of Illinois, going to places like the Skokie Lagoons on the North Shore, going to downstate farms, going to Northern Michigan forests for six, 12 months, 18 months at a time in order to perform labor uh, in the environment. And the, the interesting thing there that I, that I sort of play with in that chapter is sort of as you were saying, Devarian, right? Like the the point for so many migrants was to get away from that labor uh, right. in the environment. I don't I don't want to be subject to those those sort of discriminatory uh, you know labor policies that are associated with agricultural labor in the South. I am an urban laborer now. Well, now with the depression, you have FDR's New Deal with the Civilian Conservation Corps and other agencies sending African Americans back to the land for right. six months, 12 months at a time and performing manual labor. I mean, uh, if I was on my computer, I had all these photographs uh, queued up that I could show you some of these photographs of, you know, I mean, they look like kids, 17, 18, 19 year old kids digging out the Skokie Lagoons with mm -hmm. a, a, a white overseer, essentially looking over their shoulders um, 
So, so I've tried to play with this notion of, of, of where does, has the great migration led migrants if the children of migrants now are laboring in these environments much like their parents had and that's what their parents had, had striven to leave behind. Yeah, my, my grandmother um, picked cotton and um, in the South. And when, so when my family came up to the North, uh, there was a total desire to get away from that lifestyle, to have big cars, record players in the cars, everything modern. But at the same time, um, the one thing that I always marvel at for me is that all of her, her and her friends got together and bought plots of land for community gardens. And, and she was a very astute caretaker of, of her flower boxes in front. So there are always these, these bits and reminders of the South. And so I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit to the, um, how, what role what gardens and gardening played in all of this, and especially how did it shift from being, you know, what did it mean in the 20s, say, when it was more an a, a indicator of leisure time, you know, privilege, to the 30s when a garden was actually, you know, I need to like feed my family. Yeah, I mean, I, I deal with this a little bit in the book. Uh, unfortunately, the archives just weren't very thick with uh, these kinds of urban gardening yeah. um, artifacts and sources. Um, but from what I was able to find, uh, I think you're, you're right, absolutely right. In the teens and 20s, uh, I think urban gardening was sort of a, a middle to upper class occupation, certainly in Idlewild, right, where the middle to upper classes were recreating in the summer you see gardens being cultivated uh, really for pleasure, right? Mm -hmm. And in and, and the sort of way, honestly, that, that Booker T. Washington, uh, yep. you know, talking about his, his pleasure garden in Tuskegee, he was talking about the, the virtues uh, of gardening. Um, and, and a lot of those early, early Idlewild residents, I mean, they had a framed picture of Booker T. Washington at Idlewild. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ro Robert Abbott was a disciple. The, the, the publisher of the Defender was a disciple right. of Booker T. Washington. So that kind of, of ideology sort of permeated the middle to upper classes. For the working classes in Black Chicago in the teens and 20s, if you're thinking about living in tenement houses, living in kitchenettes, uh, working long hours, uh, all, pretty much all working age people, um, in a household working in order to make rent and, and to buy food. There just wasn't a whole lot of time and frankly space in a very densely built black belt in order to cultivate gardens. But right. you're absolutely right that in the 1930s, the stakes of gardening changes pretty immensely, right? I mean, you have the, the YMCA uh, camp in Southwestern Michigan cultivating this, this multi-acre garden uh, and, and shipping that food back to the YMCA in Chicago mm -hmm. for consumption. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you have, you know, middle upper class Idlewilder, Idlewilders, excuse me, yeah. uh, you know, cultivating gardens um, in, in a little bit more of a, you know, a, a strained setting um, that, that it's not so much for pleasure anymore, but we are sort of needing to, to cut corners and, and um, produce what we consume. Mm. Thank you for that. I mean, you mentioned Idlewild. It's interesting because, I mean, even the kind of the popular cultural imagination when when Outkast, uh, uh, Andre 3000 did an Idlewild film, they they relocated it to Atlanta. So it's, it's taken on this kind of like national black iconic memory. Uh, and then in myself growing up in, in Southern Wisconsin, I remember black Chicagoans driving by to get to Lake Ivanhoe, you know, in the shadows of Lake Geneva, where the mm -hmm. rich white where the rich white folks went, and so. You know, now we have these, not now, but when I was growing up, you had these kind of ideas about the luxury and, 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 and you know, uh, plush nature of these black resorts. But you tell a story when they were, when they were living in cots, they were sleeping on cots and tents. And could you tell us a little bit about that early story of like these black resort towns and, and what was actually going on? And also you talk about how they're trying to escape a certain kind of identity in the, in the city, but there's, but Jim Crow still confronts them in rural Michigan. And could you just lay out that, that kind of the black resort culture? Um, in this early period? Yeah, I mean, Jim Crow in, in rural Michigan, I mean, that that really dictates where Idlewild is situated in the first place, right? I mean, that that and that's part of the environmental history that I, I tell in the book is that the, the much more um, desirable land, the, the much more tony resorts were located along the Lake Michigan shore, right? And for a brief period, there was an African-American resort that was pretty desirable near Benton Harbor. That folds early in the 19 teens. Uh, 
and a couple of white land developers decide that they have a golden opportunity to, to form uh, a, an African-American resort called Idlewild Inland in Michigan. And this is an area that has largely been cut over in the late 19th century. All the white pine and other desirable uh, soft and hardwood in Michigan has largely been cut over uh, by this period in the 19 teens, 1920s when Idlewild is founded. And it is not so desirable in terms of lands. It's almost like they're pioneering this concept that, that this will be a desirable leisure escape for the elite of Chicago, of Detroit, of Cleveland, when it's not at all clear that there is an appetite for that, that there's a market for that. Mm. Um, so early on, it is, it is, as you said, really roughing it. Um, they have what they call dog houses, right? I think they're sort of, we're sort of romanticizing um, roughing it uh, in nature. Um, so they had, they had tents, yes, but they, they, there are also articles in the Defender and in the local uh, southwestern Michigan papers uh, in, in the county where Idlewild is saying that, you know, you, you, you have your servants, right? There is a clubhouse, right? That there right. is sophistication. There's basically all that you could want of uh, the sophisticated African-American life that you would find in Chicago. We can recreate that in Idlewild, but free from all of those strictures of Jim Crow. But right. of course you actually had to get to Idlewild from Chicago and to get to Idlewild from Chicago, you're either taking a train right out of Chicago and the Paramarquette uh, line up, up around there, or you're driving. And if you're driving from Chicago to Idlewild, that's not a trivial journey in the 19 teens and 1920s. Mm -hmm. And you're driving through an overwhelmingly almost exclusively white uh, part, rural part of the Midwest that is hostile to your presence, right? Mm -hmm. So Idlewilders encounter that hostility regularly, right? Sort of constantly reminded of uh, the second class citizenship, even as they are trying to escape it. And the same thing ends up confronting African-American Civilian Conservation Corps enrollees in the 1930s um, who are planting trees around Idlewilds, right? They go into town, uh, not just Idlewild, where they can enjoy um, the freedoms and the benefits of African-American culture, but if they're going into other almost entirely white towns, they are facing the same kind of racism that they're experiencing in Chicago when they venture out of the Black Belt. Mm. No, it's a great point. Um, and just to continue that conversation, there's a question in the chat um, from Rose that says, given the reality of segregation in Chicago, were um, Black people ever intimidated or prevented access to Washington Park? And I know the answer to this, but I would love for you to talk more about that. Uh, how did the racism high parks Hyde Park play out within the park. So I mean, first, I just would say, first of all, we know that the uh, Hansberry v. Lee case, mm -hmm. you know, the iconic case that led to the end of covenants was a Washington Park development case. Yeah. But yeah. I'll, I'll let you go from there. <laughs> yeah, so that, that Hansberry versus Lee case, Carl Hansberry buys that home in the late 1930s, uh, just a block or two south of Washington Park. And what was in Drake and Keaton's Black Metropolis, they call the White Islands, right? That's how it was popularly known at the time. And as soon as that Supreme Court case is decided in Carl Hansberry's favor in 1940, that block just south of Washington Park, it's more than a block. I mean, it's, it's the width of Washington Park, right? So four blocks roughly east to west. Uh, and then three or four blocks uh, north to south flips from 1940 to 1941 from exclusively white to almost entirely African American, um, which which speaks to the 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 the, the, the quickness in which uh, with which neighborhoods west of Washington Park, north of Washington Park, had transitioned in that period before then. So in the 19 teens and 1920s. Washington Park was definitely, the park itself, not just the neighborhood, but the, the park itself um, was definitely racially contested space in the 19 teens up through the 1920s. Mm -hmm. um, one of the lesser known aspects of the 1919 riot is that in the weeks and months preceding the riot, actually beginning in late July and continuing on for about a week, uh, signs were posted in Washington Park saying, we will get you July 4th. Mm. Now, those signs were obviously to anyone who was 
around, then it was clear who those signs were directed to and who they were posted by. They were posted by white supremacists, white Chicagoans, and they were targeting African-Americans who are already beginning to recreate in Washington Park in large numbers. Um, so it's, I think it's people just, don't realize how much to the degree that Washington Park had been a non-Black park. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Yeah, I mean, it was designed by Olmsted and Vox, Frederick Law Olmsted uh, of Central Park fame, you know, in the 1870s with the idea that this would be a middle to upper class and, and maybe even predominantly upper class white space, right? I mean, there just wasn't much of, of an African-American population in Chicago to speak of until the Great Migration begins in the 19 teens. And it was some of Chicago's wealthiest families. I mean, this is stockyard money, this is steel, yard, uh, steel mill money that is on the South side. So uh, all of those late 19th century homes that you see uh, in Bronzeville and down into Washington Park, I mean, these were wealthy white Chicagoans who were on their Sundays going to Washington Park uh, to parade around. And that changes really dramatically in the 19 teens and 1920s as African-American neighborhoods keep pushing South towards Washington Park. And it's really only an accident of history, I would say, that the 1919 riot started at 29th Street Beach and not at Washington Park. Yeah, because you, right? you, you, you offer wonderful detail about like, you know, uh, athletic clubs that we associate with the streets kind of, you know, look, you know, that there was a degree of working class white, white youth that understood Washington Park as theirs. In, in, in contemporary uh, Washington Park, that might be hard to fathom. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, yeah. you know, you know, back in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, James T. Farrell and the Studs Lonigan trilogy and, mm -hmm. and that fictional character, right? James T. Farrell, a, a white South Sider who, who grew up just adjacent to Washington Park and Studs Lonigan in these novels has all of these scenes about how pivotal Washington Park is in his coming of age narrative uh, and, and really vividly depicts the African American, um, you know, prevalence in that neighborhood. Certainly, as the teens and twenties wears on, uh, and, and uh, yeah, that doesn't really change until the late nineteen twenties. Mm -hmm. By the by, the time uh, Horace Hayden comes to the city in the early nineteen thirties, he comes from the West Coast, I believe. Yes, from he, Seattle. He, yeah, he has yeah. A, he has a passage in his uh, autobiography that's that says something to the effect of, in Washington Park, I saw only African-Americans playing ball, having picnics. That is very dramatically different than what Washington Park looked like just a decade earlier. Interesting, wow. Well, you know, it's funny too, because I think there are some fascinating residual traces of that kind of negotiation of parks in the present. So even in the park that, another Olmstead Park where I live in Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, there's an unspoken rule that the daytime of the park are for white mothers and their children to come into the park because there's a zoo there. And then at dusk, it's the park for the brown folks. And I think that the, you, you, see, you still see those kind of nego those unspoken negotiations of certain times of the day and night for certain demographics mm -hmm. at parks, even to this day. And so I want to bring my final question up to the present and with your work, the, the, the consequences and the, the power of your work. And let's just be clear. This work, this book won every award under the sun, like four, like four awards. I mean, it's amazing. So just to be clear about that, uh, just to bring it all into the present. But as a, my question is, uh, considering recent stories regarding like the hunger strike around General Irons, um, and I know you're familiar with that, um, how mm -hmm. did your book serve as prologue for the present? More broadly, what does an environmental lens provide us to better understand our own lived environments? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and I, I would be surprised if one of uh, the audience members doesn't ask about the Obama Presidential Center uh, in reference mm -hmm. to the, mm -hmm. the way that the public Washington Chicago Park, Park space Jackson Park. Uh, gets mapped onto the African-American experience and, and, and otherwise. I, I try to stay away from those questions, but uh, I'm Sorry. happy to entertain <laughs> the OPC question if, if necessary. I'm going to talk around it for now, the OPC bit of that. Okay. Um, but uh, I, when you, I don't think so much about the, the hunger strikers of, of General Iron, although I, I completely understand where you're coming from. Some of the new work that I'm doing uh, actually engages with Washington Park in the post-World War II era, and I think uh, even more directly about the hunger strikers um, of Diet High School, uh, sure. you know, five, ten years ago, 
Uh, Diet High School was a contested space on the north end of Washington Park. So the high school was built there in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Um, African Americans on the south side, by and large, wanted that school built. And I think that is sort of representative of what that public space means to the community still today, mm -hmm. right? That, that community members, family members were so passionate about keeping Diet High School open amidst a rash of Chicago public school closures five, 10 years ago, yep. that they were willing to go on strike to keep that building in Washington Park and to keep students going there, to keep it a destination on the South Side. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I think of too, and I, I'm, I'm thinking of this uh, in part because I'm teaching an environmental justice class uh, this semester at Lake Forest College, and have been leading a lot of field studies. Now that the COVID restrictions are a little bit relaxed, we can actually do that kind of thing again. Right. And one of the field studies that I was so happy to be able to lead students on was down to the Sweetwater Foundation uh, in the Washington Park neighborhood, just west of Washington Park itself, really between Washington Park and the Dan Ryan Expressway. And I think in a lot of ways, Landscapes of Hope offers a backstory and mm -hmm. a historical evidence of African-American connections to nature that organizations like the Sweetwater Foundation, that organizations like Blacks and Green on the South Side yep. are, are working to, to make evident and to reforge and, and to strengthen uh, in the 21st century. Because I think, you know, my book tells a story of African-American connections to the environment in the teens, 20s, and 30s. I think that the urban crisis, that discriminatory policies, redlining, restrictive covenants, et cetera, plunge the South Side into such economic and social strife in the post-World War II era that in many ways the connections to the landscaped environment, those productive connections to nature, that thread was sort of lost mm. in that era. And I think that in the 21st century, Sweetwater Foundation, other organizations like that are working to build on that rich history of African-American connections to nature and bring it back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, we're going to open it up to questions now. Thank you so much for this conversation. Time went so fast. <laughs> uh, and I do have other questions, but I want to definitely open it up for the last 12, uh, 11 minutes for a conversation and questions amongst everyone who's here. And so if you want to come off of, you want to um, show us your face, if you can, it's, your, you're up, it's up to you. You can stay um, behind your name, which is fine. Uh, you could put questions in the chat, but we do have one uh, request to, to yes, to do, to have that OPC conversation between you and I, because we both, <laughs> you talk about it. I write about it in my book. Can, can you start then, DeVere? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I gotta be, I gotta be I'm, honest I'm, with you, as someone who doesn't live on the South Side and right. is not African-American, obviously, I really hesitate to wade into these conversations that I think need to be driven by those mm -hmm. people most affected in Woodlawn and West Woodlawn. Right. I mean, I think one thing that's really interesting about the, the, the you, it, it's, it, and it speaks to your conversation about different ways, different questions being posed of different archives and demographics, is that when we track the, the, fervor, the fur over the park, which is unexpected, you know, because it's Obama, right? Everyone's hero. Um, the, 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 the claims and the resistance of the park because it takes up public park space has primarily been, not only, but primarily been a white middle-class argument. And then when you look at the arguments and claims of black individuals with the park, um, or with the, with the, um, with the presidential center, the issues have been more social economic in terms of community benefits access to the park um, and having a fair share. So it's just interesting how there's a different, I mean, it doesn't fall directly along racial lines, but there are equal critiques of the inequity of Obama's presidential center and its incapacity to serve the public good. But there's a different approach to it in terms of loss of park space as compared to compensation for the economic viability of the park, I mean, of the, of the center, or the way in which the center is gonna raise property values above the means of residence. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very interesting for me, especially when considering your work. Yeah, I mean, and, and city council, you know, ended up passing, you know, something resembling 
uh, right. you know, rent, rent control or community benefits agreement, mm-hmm. which is better than nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, I see Thais away on this, on this call and I just contributed an article to a collection she's, she's editing uh, about this very issue that actually centers on diet high school and the controversy over it in the late 60s and early 70s. Mm-hmm. And it's actually crazy the extent to which the battle lines that you just described, right? White middle class environmentalists who really don't live on the South side, don't live in Woodlawn, West Woodlawn, Washington Park, and African-Americans who actually do live in those neighborhoods in close proximity to the places we're talking about, whether it's the OPC in Jackson Park or Diet High School on the north end of Washington Park. It's crazy to the the extent to which those battle lines are almost identical, right? White middle-class environmentalists, Open Lands, other organizations like that in the late 60s and early 70s were vehemently against building Diet High School. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, African-Americans on the South side who had endured, you know, decades of Benjamin Willis as the, the superintendent and all of those educational inequalities that come along with Willis wagons and, and yeah. you, know, yeah. you know, all of that kind of stuff from earlier on in the 60s are saying, I don't care where we get a high school built, we need a high school built because mm-hmm. we have overcrowding. And if this is the option that Daly is giving us, we're going to take it, right? I mean, Ralph yeah. Metcalf, the alderman, uh, and yeah. I mean, it's, it's classic sh- sort of Chicago machine politics, right? <laughs> right. And the way that Daly played African-American aldermen uh, mm-hmm. to, to do what he wanted and, and African-American aldermen are advocating for their community too, right? But mm-hmm. like, it's, it's also, it's, it's, it's just, it's mind boggling how much uh, the battle lines are similar right. to what they were 50 years ago. And I think it really represents for, for my new work anyway, just how little the environmental movement has been able to take into account the concerns of communities of color, despite the environmental justice movement, despite, uh, Mm. you know, 30 years, 40 years now of the environmental justice movement pushing, quote unquote, mainstream white environmentalism, those battle lines are so similar to what they were 50 years ago. Well, with, with your book in mind, what's really interesting is that whether it's the argument for park space, or whether it's an argument for the right to remain, they're both environmental arguments, right? Mm-hmm. And, and But we're failing to look at them and that demonstrates the degree to which there is this inner capacity to see the fuller range of environmental imagination that your book brings to the conversation. That by doing that, wow, this is why we, this is, these are the things we couldn't see when we had a traditional environmental lens. All these other things emerge, you know, uh, cancer clusters around around idling buses, and mm-hmm. you know, I think about New York City where I, where I was went to school for for years, or you know, uh, um, um, biohazard clusters in certain neighborhoods. These things all become relevant where before they weren't. It's just about his preservation, or conversely, the degree to which you know um, green space preservation in certain neighborhoods becomes a, a mechanism for not building affordable housing. Right, it becomes a, le- mm-hmm. a, a buffer for development, and so. These fault lines, I'm just I'm really interested in, 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 could you say a little bit about what your new book is going to be about? Just kind of a, a little teaser, if you will, that, where is it going to take us? <laughs> well, if it ever gets written, Devarian, uh, <laughs> the, the, the idea is that it's, it's trying to excavate a backstory to the environmental justice movement uh, in the late 60s and 1970s. Because the environmental justice movement, typically historians, sociologists point to the beginning as, as 1982, Warren, Warren County, North Carolina, protests over... Uh, a PCB uh, laden toxic waste dump. But if you look at the rhetoric of mainstream environmentalists, and you look at the rhetoric of a lot of communities of color uh, at the origins of the modern environmental movement in the late 60s and early 70s, it is pointing towards a more broadly inclusive movement. It is pointing to a more broadly inclusive definition of what the environment is. So, I mean, exactly to your point, right? What what do we consider an environment worth protecting? uh, An environment that is, you know, lumped into the environmental movement. Mm -hmm. People were saying in the late 60s and early 70s that it needs to be something beyond Yosemite National Park in Alaska, right? right? And yet that's sort of the way the environmental movement matures in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, which helps in part spur the grassroots environmental justice movement. So the project is really focused on the 70s and trying to trace how these critical divisions emerged Mm 
despite a lot of people, uh, not just in, in organizations like the Sierra Club, but also like the Urban League and the NAACP trying to bridge those gaps and ultimately failing. So the animating question is how and why that happened. How and why do we get to a point where grassroots activists are saying enough is enough. The environmental movement is not doing what we need it to do. So mm. people of color have to do it for ourselves. So what you're arguing in a certain kind of way, I mean, what you're finding is that there's actually an alter alternate history of the environment environmentalism origins that we've not seen because of the way in which environmentalism defines itself. Totally, yeah, that history this, is- This is rooted in your first book, obviously, right? This is. This comes from your first book, the orientation of your first book. So that's amazing that it helped, it led you to another kind of story about how we do environmental history of itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the next book is more overtly political, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the projects of the first book, Landscapes of Hope, was to actually sort of push back on this right. fixation on environmental injustice. Racism and I'm not trying to discount that, like that. that is, central to to the book right i mean I, I i understand and talk about how any unequal unequal access to something like 29th street beach or washington park is an environmental injustice but to me when i set out on that project like the story of environmental injustice has been told like i i think we understand that story because of all that good work that historians and sociologists and other folks have done over the past 20 30 years and that's not the story that I wanted to tell about Black Chicago, because I yeah. think I think you miss something of the, something critical when you only see the environment right. as something that is, you know, something apart from African Americans. Yeah. With, yeah. That, that it's, it's that the story is always about pollution. And it's always about unequal exposure. That is key to the story. But if you only focus on that, you lose. The, the point of why African-Americans cared about the environment in the first place. Mm. And that, that's the story that I wanted to tell in Landscapes of Hope is how and why the environment, natural and landscape environments, nature, how and why nature mattered to African-Americans. Wow, what a great legacy. And when I think about your book, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, create, trademark this, but uh, you know, this, this is a practice, a product of black landscaping. Um, and what does that mean as an ethos, as a way of moving through the world? Equally as important to the kind of work that I do in terms of strolling. Uh, you know, how, why do we need to put black landscaping next to strolling along 35th and, and state? And as a viable thing of making oneself over as modern is just as much about how you engage and and uh, rebuild or retrofit your landscape and, and what a wonderful legacy um, of your book. And, and, and we thank you so much for writing it and everybody again, go out and get it. Landscapes of hope, uh, go to the seminary and get it first. Uh, <laughs> and if you don't already have it, go get a copy for a friend. This multi award winning book. We, we thank you, uh, Brian, for writing it and for, for being here and having the conversation with you about it. Um, and we hope to have many more conversations. Thank you. Well, thank you, Devery, and that's that's very humbling to hear you say that. I'm I'm blushing. The, the, the Midwestern in me is definitely blushing. <laughs> I can relate. Yeah. <laughs> Devery said it perfectly. Um, thanks so much. As really interesting and important conversation. Um, thanks to our partners uh, at Chicago Studies, including Tess. Uh, thanks to you both, Brian and Devarian. I uh, hope we can do it again soon. Sounds good. Thank Great. you. Thanks everyone. Thanks for having me. Someone's asking me if there's a way to record. Is this recorded? Just uh, there's somebody in the chat asking. Yes, it's been recorded. It'll be available on the Chicago Studies website at uh, Chicago Studies at So it'll be there Great. for viewing. All right. Fantastic. Thanks again, Thanks everyone. Everybody. Great. Thanks it's everyone. Fun. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for hanging with me during my technical difficulties. Hey, we're all here <laughs> together. <laughs> Good night.